Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at Judges chapters 17 and 18, The Worship Wars. The book of Judges started off with a prologue in two parts, then we had all of the different narratives, but notice at the very bottom, at the end, we have an epilogue now in two parts. And so part one we're going to look at during this session. Next time we'll come back and look at part two. Judges chapter 17, verse 1. Now there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Last time we talked about Ephraim, well, that was ac actually in the, under the Jephthah narrative. We looked at, at Ephraim. But now here's just one man who's from Ephraim. His name is Micah. Verse 2. He said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse in my hearing, behold, the silver is with me, and I took it. So um, we, we sort of jump right in the middle of the story with a conversation that's telling us what happened earlier in the story, that his mother had had 1,100 pieces of silver. That was quite an amount, and evidently it had been stolen, and she has put a curse on whoever stole it, and then he says, well, I'm the one that stole it, and so here I'm giving it back to you, and his mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. So she takes that curse away, and she turns it into a blessing. Verse 3, He then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I wholly dedicate the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. This is not good. This is idolatry. Now, therefore, I will return them to you. So, he has stolen. She is encouraging idolatry. Verse 4, so when he returned the silver to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of the silver and gave them to the silversmith who made them into a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. So the house of Micah now has an idol sitting in it. Verse 5, and the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household idols and consecrated one of his sons that he might become his priest. He's trying to set up his own religion. Notice he makes a shrine, a Beth Elohim, a house of God. As he's starting his religion, he's starting his church, he's got his priest, one of his sons, and he's off and running. Verse 6, this is the refrain. We started off with the song, if, if you can call it that, not a, not a happy song, a sad song, and now the refrain, In those days there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Is that a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. It's a terrible thing. There was no king in Israel, so people were just doing their own thing. And their own thing, in this case, looked like idolatry. Chapter 17, verse 7. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem. Enter person number 2. Uh, actor number 2 in our drama. A young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he was staying there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a very tiny little village, but we're going to see Bethlehem in each of these stories. Verse 8. Then the man departed from the city, from Bethlehem and Judah, to stay wherever he might find a place. He is no longer happy with, his, or with where he lives. And as he made his journey, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. And so, man from Bethlehem, Levite from Bethlehem, leaves Bethlehem and makes his way up. And he happens upon Ephraim. He happens upon the house of Micah. Verse 12, so Micah offers him a, a pay raise and a new position. Micah says, how would you like to, instead of being a Levite, how would you like to be bumped up to priest? And the, the man says, gee, that's good. I'm ambitious. Let me go, you know, let me take this promotion. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest. I guess his son goes back to just being a son. The young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. And then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord, notice it's Yahweh, when, I see, when you see the word Lord in all caps, it's Yahweh. Now I know that the Lord will prosper me, seeing that I have a Levite as a priest. 
God has to do what I tell him to do because now I've got an extra special priest. Not just one of my sons. I've got a professional priest. Chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, here's the refrain again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. He doesn't repeat, and everyone did, did what was right in his own eyes, because that's, that's already taking place. But in those days, the tribe of Dan was seeking an inheritance for themselves to live in. For until that day, an inheritance had not been allotted to them as a possession among the tribes of Israel. Yes, they had been given some land, but the Philistines already had that. Remember in the, in the Samson story, the people of Dan were uncomfortably close to where the Philistines lived, and these people of Dan decided, we don't want to live near the Philistines anymore. We don't want to be where God had said that we would have possession. We, we don't have a possession. We want one of our own. And so, in verse 2, so the sons of Dan sent from their family five men out of their whole number, valiant men from Zorah and Eshtael, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, go search the land. It's almost like, like we're going back to the, the book of Joshua again. Only instead of two, not twelve, not two, now it's five. And they're going to search out the land. Verse, rest of verse 2, And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. Now, that's Ephraim. That's already taken. They can't take that land. Verse 6, And the priest said to them, Go in peace. Your way in which you are going has the Lord's approval. And they thought, Oh, this is good. The priest is speaking for us. Now, is the priest speaking authoritatively? I don't know. He says that he is. But, remember, he's he's gotten his job not from the Lord but from Micah. He's sort of a do-it-yourself priest. He's got this this quick, sort of a, uh, a quick charge ordination um, uh, process that he got in, like, in the mail. Mail order ordination. Well, verse 7, then the five men departed and they go north now and they came to Laish. Now Laish is way up in the north. It's as far as you can go in the north and still be in Israel. It's right on the northern border of Israel, right under Mount Hermon. And they came to Laish and saw the people who were in it living in security after the matter of, manner of the Sidonians. It's, they're, they're Phoenician, in other words, Canaanite. They're quiet and secure. Rest of verse 7, For there was no ruler humiliating them for anything in the land, and they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. They're, they're, you come to this place where Laish is, um, right under, Mount, right just south of Mount Hermon, right on the southern slopes of Mount Hermon, and it is beautiful, and it is, is peaceful, and you're in this wide open valley, and there are mountains sort of hemming you in, and it's a great place. It's the headwaters of the Jordan River. And so they came to Laish. We have uncovered the city of Laish. The ruins that you're looking at here date back to the days of Canaan and earlier. Possibly all the way back to Abraham. And so the people of Dan, they're going to relocate. And in relocating, they come up and they come past Ephraim. And they say to the young Levite turned priest, Gee, how would you like a pay raise? How would you like a promotion? Why don't you come with us? And the priest comes with them and takes the household gods with them, the pagan altars, the pagan idols. And they relocate now to Laish and they conquer the people of Laish, put them all to the sword. And they call the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, uh, their father, who was born in Israel. However, the name of the city, we're told formerly was Leish, but now it becomes Dan. And this is a foundation story of how the city of Dan and the tribe of Dan end up in the place that comes to be known as Dan. And they take their priest with them, with his pagan altars. In fact, when our friend Micah says, wait a minute, you're taking away my altar and my priest. Now they say, watch out, or we're going to do to you like we did to those Canaanites. We're going to kill you. And he just sort of goes home empty-handed. 
Well, chapter 18, verse 30, the sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests, that now we're told the name of the priests, uh, to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, when you speak of the captivity of the land, which captivity is it? Is that the uh, captivity when Israel is carried away, the northern tribes of Israel are carried away by the Assyrians? Is this the Babylonian captivity? Is this some other captivity? It's not really clear. But if it is one of those latter, then that means the book of Judges is written much, much later because it's referencing that captivity. Verse 31, So they set up for themselves Micah's graven image, which he had made, all the time that the house of God was at Shiloh. The house of God, there's no temple yet. There's a tabernacle, sort of a permanent tabernacle, at a place called Shiloh. But while that is there, there's another place of worship that's been set up here at Dan. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that this place of Dan, and what you're looking at here, is the archaeological uh, restoration of the temple of Dan, and in, in that metal um, sort of framework, they put where they believe the altar stood for the worship. It was, they were supposed to be worshiping God, but they were utilizing these pagan idols. And at a much later date, those idols would be replaced with golden calves that Jeroboam would establish and set up for the worship. Supposed to be worshiping God, but they're doing it by the worship of idols and a golden calf. One at Dan, later on one, one at Bethel as well. It reminds us of the words of Jesus, who told us that the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and but also in truth, in spirit and in truth. And he came to point us the way to God that we might worship God, not just in spirit, yes, but in spirit and truth. And we're called to do that through him.